All right, welcome, welcome everyone. I want to make the most of our time with Sister Simone Campbell, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Take a seat. All right, for those who don't know or for those who are watching online, um, my name is Meredith Dodson. I'm the director of the uh, U.S. Poverty Campaign Work at Results, uh, and I'm based here in Washington, D.C., and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Sister Simone Campbell. Um, I'm going to do it. I confess, by the way, that every time I see Sister Simone, I get the all about the bus, none trouble uh, <laughs> song in my head, which I urge you uh, for uh, viewing pleasure to check out on YouTube at some point. So uh, just know that's running in my head the whole time you're talking. Um, but anyway, uh, Sister Simone Campbell has served as the executive director of Network since 2004. And I know many of you have had the chance to see her on TV appearances, hopefully in person before. She is a religious leader, attorney and poet with ex extensive experience in public policy and advocacy for systemic change, who lobbies on issues of peace building, immigration reform, health care, and of course economic justice. She's led three cross-country nuns on the bus trips. How many of you have, have gotten a chance to hang out with the nuns on the bus? The, and a lot of that was focused on economic justice, comprehensive immigration reform, and voter turnout. So I'm going to actually do something in results we don't all the time do, but it's part of our history, uh, just briefly so you know the audience uh, that you're talking to. So. Uh, this is results volunteers from across the United States and across the world. So quickly, stand if you've ever met a member of Congress or a member of Parliament face-to-face -face before. All right, remain standing if you've done that more than five times. More than ten. Right, take a seat. And then another thing, just so again, uh, to have a sense of the audience, that was a great crowd. Uh, stand if you've ever had or generated, meaning it could be an editorial rather than something under your name, um, media coverage of economic justice issues or poverty issues before. Five or more pieces. <laughs> Ten or more pieces. And take a seat and uh, go ahead and stand if you're going to Capitol Hill for the first time tomorrow. <laughs> So, uh, so Sister Simone is such an amazing leader, and I wanted her to get a sense of, of the really amazing folks in the crowd, too. So uh, I could go on and on about why I think she's just one of the real visionaries we need. How many members of Network are in the audience? Yeah, how many members of Network are in the audience? Some. Remain standing if you used to uh, be an intern with Network back in the day. Oh, there were some. <laughs> oh, there she <laughs> All right. So uh, anyway, we, uh, I've had the uh, pleasure of working for a number of years with the great network staff, but Sister Simone is really one of the visionary leaders in the anti-poverty movement, um, and uh, I'm thrilled that she's joining us. So everyone, Sister Simone Campbell. <laughs> are too, too kind. <laughs> now the pressure is on. I better say something good. But I, I'll, you'll discover I joke about most things. But one of the things I joke about is about leading a quiet life. I recommend joining the convent for that. <laughs> so uh, anybody feel called, come on along. It's great fun. And it's a great pleasure to partner with you in this very challenging time. And we need your voice. I got in on the last part of Jeffrey Sachs' talk and was so touched by his clarity about what we need to do to build the new, which requires us being able to come together, not to polarize, not to pull apart, but to come together to move forward. So what I'm going to do is talk a bit about some of the issues within our own 
nation, understanding that some of you are international uh, from other uh, countries, you have some of the same issues, some better news, some less good news, but it is the same reality, but I'm gonna use the US as exhibit A um, for the challenge. And I wanna start with um, amazing Pope Francis, seems to be a theme that's emerging here, yeah. with, uh, <laughs> it's really nice to say I like the Pope, but, um, <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> you know, we've had a little trouble. But, but the part that people, a lot of people don't realize is our little organization, Network, got named by the Vatican as being a bad influence on Catholic sisters in the United States. At the time, we had nine full-time staff, and we made the Vatican nervous. But <laughs> as, as a person of faith, I have to say it was the Holy Spirit, because it was, in fact, that notoriety then that my prayer was, how do we use this moment for mission? And the result was nuns on the bus. And so we would have never had nuns on the bus if it hadn't been for the Vatican. So I like to say, well, they started it. You know? <laughs> uh, they'd probably say I started it with the healthcare letter, but we won't go into that. Um, but Pope Francis, in Joy of the Gospel, a document he issued in November of 2013 said, that just as the commandment thou shalt not kill sets a clear limit in order to safeguard the value of human life, today we also have to say thou shalt not to an economy of exclusion and inequality. Such an economy kills. How can it be that it is not a news item when an elderly homeless person dies of exposure? but it is news when the stock market loses two points. That's the challenge we're facing, is a culture that has shifted from being people-oriented to being economy-oriented. The other day I was up on Capitol Hill, glad to see so many of you are going tomorrow, that's fabulous, we need you up there. But I was talking to senators about how can they raise this issue of economic exclusion, economic inequality, and they, they weren't quite sure how to do it. And one of the things that I realized was in the United States, we have our constitution and the preamble, it almost says, we the economy. Hmm. It doesn't say we the people. And so one of the things that's so important about your work is that we bring it back to being we the people of the United States, we the people of this world so that we put our priorities in proper perspective. So I want to share a couple of stories to start with. And uh, about a year, and, uh, a little over a year ago, I got to be at the White House when President Obama signed the executive order to raise minimum wage for the uh, contract workers. And I was in the second row, it was so exciting. But I was sitting next to this young woman, probably mid-20s, late-20s, who could not sit still. She was so excited. And she had her phone out and she took a picture of her chair. And then she, <laughs> she handed me the phone and asked me if I would take a picture of her in her chair. <laughs> so we did that. And, and then I got talking with her and I uh, complimented her on this sapphire blue dress she was wearing. And uh, she said that she had gotten it at the store where she works full time. And uh, that she'd gotten it with her employee discount and it was on sale and she only paid $20.43 for it. And since I always like a bargain, I remembered that vividly. And she was <laughs> so excited. And I found out her name was Robin and we got talking. And it turns out that she was there to support a friend of hers who was gonna get a raise because of the president's order. She wasn't gonna get a raise. But what she said was, you know, if, she, if my friend gets a raise, eventually I will too. Hmm. I know it'll keep going. And then we talked a little bit more and she said that she works full time for minimum wage in Virginia, Northern Virginia, and she made $7.25 an hour. After a year, she got a 10 cent an hour increase. So she was making $7.35 an hour and then she said to me, you know, by looking at me, you would never know, I have to live in a homeless shelter 
because I can't afford rent in this area. That is an economy of exclusion. That is an economy where a woman who works full time is not able to pay rent. That is wrong in our beloved nation. Then I was at a business round table. We're hosting these round tables because <laughs> As you find out, I talk about the 100% all the time, but I didn't know about business entrepreneurs or CEOs, and I figured, well, I need a tutorial. So we started doing these business roundtables around the country just to get a perspective of business, because we've got to include them in our conversation. And so at this one roundtable in Chicago, I got to ask the question I'd been dying to ask. It had just come out that the average salary for a CEO of a publicly traded company was $10 million a year, and they were going to $11 million. And I figured out that Robin earns in three, excuse me, Robin earns in a year what a CEO at $10 million earns in three hours. And it was just seemed a little out of perspective. And so I said to the <laughs> CEOs, I said, they were all guys, and so I said, guys, this is, you know, I'm just really curious, could you answer my question? Um, I hear that the average salary for a CEO of a publicly traded company is $10 million, but that you're going for $11 million. And is that because you're not getting by on $10 million? Or, <laughs> you know, that you just need a little extra? What, what's this about? And like that, this one guy answered. He said, no, no, Sister Simone, it's not about the money. Oh, yeah. oh, I go, that's what I said. <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> it's not about the money? What do you mean? He said, no. We're very competitive, and we want to win. It just happens that right now, the measure of winning is money. So my response was, well, could we change the measure to something a little less toxic, please? <laughs> so I'm, and I know I'm very competitive. I'm a lawyer and practice law for a bunch of years, and so I am very competitive. It makes me a very good lawyer and a very sore loser, so. Um, <laughs> it's good news, bad news. So I don't play board games or those kinds of things. But, <laughs> but what I do compete around is Twitter. I have Twitter followers, and so I'm very pleased to report that I achieved one goal of getting, uh, what, about 10 days ago, to getting to 12,000 Twitter followers. But now, here, I have a new audience. So I'm going for 13, so help me out. <laughs> but the competitive part that's really important is that that is that entrepreneurial eagerness, wanting to win. We share that a lot. We want to win. We want to make a difference in policy. We want things better for our people. But it's at what measure are we looking at this? Mm -hmm. And so my question becomes, how do we move from this personal, individualized measure of winning as how much money do I get to the competitive common good where we're in this together? where we return, we go from being we the economy to back to being we the people. How do we move our measure of success to a measure where everyone does better? Everyone is engaged in this process. Everyone is working together to form this more perfect union or to create a world where all are included and no one is left out. It's a big, huge challenge that we're facing, and you all are at the heart, at the center of some of that work, of making the change, of creating results. I mean, your name sort of says you're a little competitive about getting <laughs> something done, right? Right? You want measures, you want to know how many it is, you want to see it happen. But what we've got to do is to shift to this common good mentality, which then brings people together not isolates them. So what I want to do is what some of you may have seen this done, but it really is to explain what's happening in our nation because I think we have to have accurate information in order to be able to then respond 
with our appropriate advocacy asks, okay? Got it? So what we're gonna do is make a human bar graph. How many of you have seen a human bar graph about the change in income in our nation? Anybody? A couple of you, good, good, good. Great, then, then you're gonna be my tutoring assistants to help people remember it when they say, when later people say, what'd she say, what was that? You can be the in charge of making sure people know, okay? So what I need are five volunteers, and I seated four already, so I'm gonna need one extra volunteer to come on down. Just come on down. But you can move. Yeah, okay, and I'm gonna move down and grab for that microphone down there. Perfect. Okay, two, four, five. That's all right, you can be in our advanced class. Uh, six, and then I will need one more for the advanced class. Somebody else willing? Oh, oh, everybody's willing. Okay, come on, come on up. We'll, we'll pick over there, that's, that's fine. Okay, you two, why don't you, the two of you in our advanced class can just be back here for a minute. Okay, um, okay, and I love it when I'm someplace and they have name tags on, it's really helpful. Okay. Deborah, what? Okay, each one of these five is going to represent 20% of our U.S. population. Okay, so Deborah, you're going to represent the top 20%. Okay, Manny, you're going to represent the next. Allison, you are going to be the beloved middle class. Now, everyone thinks they are the middle class. <laughs> I had a lawyer approach me, he told me he made over 250,000 a year and he was sure he was middle class. <laughs> and then I had up at, anybody, any Trenton, New Jersey folks? Any folks from New Jersey? Hey, a few, okay. I was at the Trenton College of New Jersey and did this and a junior, a young guy, discovered his family was at the bottom, he had no idea, and he got tears in his eyes. He said, I always thought we were middle class. I never knew my parents really protected us from that. They got both my sister and I to college. It was pretty amazing. And then he pauses and would do a mother's heart great. He said, I'm gonna have to call him tonight and say thanks. <laughs> oh, whoa, wow, what, a, what an amazing young man that is. Okay, so uh, Allison is the middle. Margaret, you'll be the next to the bottom. And Vanessa, the bottom. <laughs> All right, so Deborah, right? Okay, Deborah, come on up. And guys, see how this line is? Remember the x axis? So just put your toes against. Oh, very nicely done. Often the top 20% has a tendency to kind of move up on the ground. <laughs> okay, so Deborah, what you're gonna do is you're gonna take one step of ch for every 5% change. Now before we do this, what we have to know is that between 1949 and 1979, that 30 year period, everybody's income went up about 100%, okay? Everybody's income, so the bottom, Vanessa down there, her income went up really 116%. Deborah's income went up 86%, but it was pretty close to 100. And everybody knows that a bigger percentage of a small number isn't still never gonna be the same dollar amount as a smaller percentage of a big number, right? We, we've got that. But it was all about 100%. Okay. So, Deborah, between 1980 and 2010, I am Please, excuse me, yeah, 2010. I am pleased to tell you that your income went up 49.7%. So you get 10 steps, because that's, we'll just make it 50%. So you get 10 steps. Now don't take ginormous, but kind of, kind of good stride steps and just head down, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, perfect. Manny, come on up. Uh, it's on this side. Oh, <laughs> now you're trying to cheat. You just have to get back a little bit. Okay, there you go. All right, Manny. I am pleased to tell you that in this same 30 year period, 1980 to 2010, your income went up 23%. So you get four and a half steps. You ready? Go, mark it, go one, two, three, four and a half, 
perfect. Allison, line yourself up. Middle class, always very observant, done very well. <laughs> I'm pleased to tell you that in the same 30 year period, your income went up 11%. Okay. So you get two steps. Okay. Ready? Yep. One, two. Perfect. Okay, Margaret, line yourself up. Uh, Margaret, in this same 30 year period, uh, I am pleased and a little horrified to tell you that your income went up 4%. So you get one step. You ready? One. Just don't spend it all in one place. Okay, <laughs> Vanessa, come on down. Okay, you can scoot up just a teeny. There you go. Um, Vanessa, uh, sorry, lo siento mucho, señorita. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, but in this same 30-year period, your income went down 7%. You have to take a step and a half back. Ready? One, two. Look at this. Look at this. We've got the top 20% grew 50%. But the next, Manny here, is less than half of that. And then basically, I mean, think of it, 30 years, and Allison only had an 11% increase. These folks are basically clumped at little or no change. Really? It's pretty flat. So if you felt like, oh my heavens, things have been a little stressful, they have. You're oriented to reality. This is a good thing. <laughs> but it's a bad thing that you have to be oriented to this reality, and that's what we're going to try to change, right? Okay, now, but Deborah up there is unintentionally hiding a bit of data. And so that's where we have the advanced class. So can I ask the advanced, uh, okay, so bar graph just slide close to that side. Okay, advanced class, come on up. Okay, Ellen and Clarice. How beautiful. Okay, Ellen, why don't you be going to be our top 5%? Uh, you lined yourself up very nicely. Very good. Um, I am pleased and horrified to tell you that the top 5% in the same 30 year period. Your income went up 73%. Wow. Eh, well, we'll find out. You might be over in Arlington, but we'll see. <laughs> okay, okay, so you get 15 and a half steps. You ready? One, One two, two, three, three four, five, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine ten, ten, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and a half. Wow. All right. All right, now. <laughs> all right, Clarice Shea. How perfectly lined up. Very nice, very nice. Now I am truly horrified to tell you that as the top 1% in our beloved nation, your income went up 224%. You get 45 steps. Yes, yes. Just make a, a left or a right as you get down there. Okay, are you ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, six seven, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, Three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five. Look at this. Look at it. Because this is the challenge that we're facing when it comes to the struggle of Vanessa and Margaret and Allison in our society, and to some extent, Manny. Because what happens in our society often is folks at the bottom part start blaming each other. Mm -hmm. yeah. Middle class folks start saying, huh, it's about 
Vanessa back there, I mean, you know, really, if she could work harder, had maybe a fifth job, she might be okay, you know. My tax dollars are supporting lazy people. But you know what? That comes from the pressure of feeling so stressed. And the fact that this crowd is in close proximity. But in our 19, uh, 2012 um, presidential cycle, for those of you that weren't here, that you were blessed by missing it, <laughs> um, Governor Romney, who was running for president, who's actually even way further beyond uh, Clarissa back there because she, he is in the top 0.1% of income. So just imagine how far away that would be. He said 47% of the people in our nation are takers. Remember that? Yeah. All right. But what I finally figured out by doing this, it's because he's so far away from the lived reality that he had no clue how hard it is to be in the lower income, lower half of our society. Now, there's also this study done by the um, American Psychological Association about who is most stressed in our society. Who, yeah, I am. You're willing to volunteer. Okay. Pick me, pick me. But, but what they discovered was a little surprising. The most stressed group wasn't Vanessa. Vanessa folks, they knew they were toast. They knew it was hopeless. <laughs> but it's Margaret here. Margaret here in the next to the bottom is feeling the stress of barely getting by, had knows a bunch of friends that have slipped back with Vanessa, Vanessa, has a lot of stress on her to try to make it. And the second most stressed crowd, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Ellen. Ellen. Ellen, you are the second most stressed because you know why? They are trying to look like the top 1%. The top 1%, so they often have the most debt, the biggest pressure to look good, um, are living paycheck to paycheck. Because remember, this is just income, not wealth. But what we do know is that we're in this together. And that Vanessa's job, perhaps as a janitor, keeps Clarisha, I'm not saying your name right. It's okay? Clarisha, I put the accent on the wrong place. Clarisha's, um, uh, Vanessa as a janitor would keep Clarisha's office clean. But I did this one place and I was talking about how Clarisha needs Vanessa, Vanessa needs Clarisha, and somebody raised their hand and they said, yes, but Sister Simone, Clarisha never sees Vanessa. She thinks her office gets cleaned by elves. <laughs> but the challenge is it doesn't. The challenge is Clary Shea in making decisions will say, well, we're going to outsource cleaning to a contractor who pays only hourly, no benefits, and we're going to save ourselves a lot of money. That doesn't work for the common good, but it works for her shareholders. <laughs> now, one more piece of information, and then, then we'll uh, move on. Let me make sure I've got all this. The shareholders put pressure on Clary Shea to get as much profit as possible. Now, we got sold the idea in the United States that our individual retirement accounts should be invested 
So we all own a piece of the rock, as they say, or of the market. And so our small investment accounts, we think it's a good thing if they grow well. And that puts pressure on the Clarichets and the other leaders of, of the economy to make sure that we keep getting growth. So we help fuel that pressure, which then keeps them looking for savings, which then keeps Vanessa at the bottom. See the connection? The other thing that we do is we shop at stores like Robbins and look for a bargain. And that part of the price of the bargain is either the supply chain or the wages paid or other aspects. So it's not about them. This issue is about us. We are in this together. And it's a lot easier to create an enemy over there and then to the barricades. You know, there's something so, so, so satisfying about having a good fight, you know, and just winning. Yeah. The problem is we're all in this together. And we've got to find a way to make change. See how that, see how that is? Okay, now just flip over your sign so everybody can see what numbers we're talking about. Clary Shays up there is 1.2 million in income each year. Now the CEO's salary of 10 million puts him or her in the 0.1%. The next top 5% is 200,000 a year. Now what you're gonna need to know when you go lobby at Congress, con members of Congress get paid almost 200%, so they by definition are at least in the top 5%. So when you think you're common with the story of we the people, what, this is what I say to Paul Ryan. Anybody gonna go visit Paul Ryan tomorrow? Oh, I hope so. Just drop in on him, please. But, <laughs> but what, what I say to him is that he needs to know my people, which is everybody outside of his little circle. Yeah. That's the challenge. Is this family, or is this family? family, it's household. And all of the footnotes, everything's up on our website. If you look for walking quintiles at networklobby.org, you mm. can get all the details. Okay, next is, oh, in the top 20% uh, uh, is above 112,000. Uh, Manny's is 73,000 to 112. The real middle class in, is 48 to 73. Now, there's been a slight variation uh, over the, the years, but it's still pretty much that. Next to the bottom is 27 to 48, and the bottom here is below 27,000. Now, with the recession, there's been a bunch of changes. We're trying to get updated information, but it's really hard to get, uh, compare apples to apples, but to, to show what happened. Okay, let's thank our bar graph. And thank you, Rob. Now, Clary Shays, uh, paper is done on a lighter um, uh, paper because, and you have to run back, thank you. Um, it's because the, uh, at one place where I did this, the 1% walked off with the, with the label. <laughs> so. Okay, so what do we do? This is awful, ain't it awful? Okay, but you know what? Our policies made this reality. Remember I told you that over 30 years before, everybody grew by 100%. So there are a few key policies that can make a difference for all of us, for the 100%. Um, and Pope Francis, uh, we have a Pope's platform uh, that we're going to be rolling out uh, in advance of his visit, but uh, basically it's this. We need to mend the gap. We need to change this reality and move it forward. Tax policy is the thing we have to be most excited and committed to, and it's the most boring topic to talk about. 
So we're trying to change how we talk about tax policy. So we have uh, Taxpayer Pride Day, April 15th, where we ask everybody to <laughs> send in a selfie holding a sign saying what you're most proud to take, you know, pay your taxes for. We have We the Taxpayer, which is the most exciting conversation you could ever have about taxes. And um, the, the, key, the two key policies that made the, or three key policies that made the big difference for this story was one, um, income tax rate, the tax rate on the top until the Reagan era was about 80%. It then got reduced down to 33%. As long as it was 80%, what's the big deal about getting big salaries? Because it's only going to get taxed. But if I could get 66%, 67% of it, hey, that's worth having uh, high taxes. So that is preference. Put the pressure on to get um, to make the measure of winning how much your salary is. The second one is this idea we were talking about about investment income. Some folks have been able to structure all their income so that it's only as, as seen as um, dividends and interests, called carried interest. It's a lot of esoteric conversation. But all you need to know is everybody should pay their fair share. That if you're making a million dollars, you should pay your fair share. You're making that money because of the amazing nation that we are, so contribute. It's not about paying as little as possible. The issue is about contributing your fair share to build up our nation. I'm actually a fiscal conservative. I believe we should pay for what we need. But I also believe, there, therefore, it's not about cutting the budget. It's about spending on what we, our nation really needs, investing in our nation, so that you can encourage people to pay their fair share. It's a great Republican talking point. It's a great Democratic talking point. The definition of fair seems to be the challenge. Yeah. Um, and finally, the tax policy that made a huge difference was estate tax. Because we're having the biggest transfer of wealth in our nation. And uh, recently, the Urban Institute did a um, study on wealth disparity. And the racial wealth gap in our nation is being increased and exacerbated by uh, not having a, a responsible estate tax. Because what's happening is, is that the established families with the wealth are white folks. And that they consol that's a consolidation of wealth, actually, that we've got to face as a nation. It's underlying Ferguson. It's underlying Charleston. It's underlying a bunch of stuff. And we, the people, have got to face up to the racial issues in our society. <laughs> White, white privilege is huge. And walking in the world as a white person makes it hard to know how to properly intervene. But I can tell you, intervene we must and let our hearts be broken by what's happening so that we don't keep it up. We've got to break out of the sin of our past. Um, so that leads to wages and salaries. Uh, wages and salaries are at the heart of a big piece of the problem down here. The fact that Robin could work full time but not be able to pay rent, that's wrong in the richest nation on earth. But the corollary to that is labor organizing. Labor organizing is the only way to really make wages rise. And that we can see a direct correlation between uh, in the 80s when President Reagan was undermining unions and Congress was undermining unions, that's when wages started going flat and pulling back. So it's, it's like you can see a one-to-one -one relationship there. Um, the other issue we have to face up to is housing and transportation. Housing policy in our nation is uh, bankrupt. Um, our beloved city, I, I mean, I've talked to Manny and a couple others are saying it's their first time in D.C. It's fabulous. But I love our city. It's fabulous. I live down in the southwest. I bike to work. It's wonderful. But what's happening is everybody's building luxury condominiums. No one is building ordinary, everyday um, housing. 
And as a as a watcher, anybody else have the secret pleasure of wa watching home and garden television? <laughs> HGTV, yes, yeah. yes. Anyway, I think, you know, granite countertops are required every place. But um, <laughs> the fact is we have got to change our housing policy so that we can house our people in a responsible way close to employment. Because when I was in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, we were at the Salvation Army ho uh, Family Homeless Shelter. And there, the, the families, everybody was working. Everybody, every family member had, I mean, every family had a working full-time parent, but they couldn't find housing. But the homeless shelter for families was in the center of town and their jobs were on the outskirts. They had to cut back on their hours because they couldn't, the bus wouldn't run into town. So they had to leave their job at quarter to eight to catch the eight o'clock bus to come back to town when they could have been working a couple more hours. Housing and transportation go together and we cannot get them siloed because we can fight each other over it. And that's, that's no help at all. We've got to make, um, we've got to bridge those gaps. And finally, what do you do? Um, is because until we get this changed, we need a safety net. We need to protect our people who fall on hard times. I met Anne and she was telling me that she and her husband both have master's degrees, but in the recession they lost their jobs. And when they lost their jobs, they lost their house, they lost their income. Um, they have four teenage kids. She was lucky to get a job in a bookstore. He finally got a job as seasonal construction, but it was so hard. And in, this was New York State, which had some better policies than most. They could get a little cash assistance for a while but not long. Congressman Paul Ryan says he's gonna work on temporary assistance to needy families reform. That's the former welfare program. And one of the big problems that we face is that the safety net is not really a net for folks who fall on hard times. It's seen as a punitive judgment where people are tossed out and seen as not valued. What we have to do is we have to make some change. Earned income tax credit and child tax credits being used by business to avoid paying real wages. If you avoid paying real wages, then your people can use EITC or CTC or get food stamps. But Jason in San Diego told me that he, he as an entrepreneur was getting mad. He was getting mad because he realized his tax dollars were going to fund his competitors. And I go, what? He says, no, no, they are, because what he realized was he pays a living wage to all his workers. But in a contract where you're bidding for contracts, his competitors had lower personnel costs because they paid low wages and expected their employees to use Medicaid, to use food stamps, to get uh, housing vouchers. So while he was doing the responsible ethical thing by paying a living wage, his competitors weren't. And so what we have to do is change business so that business becomes once again ethical where it is the agreed upon uh, situation that business pays its real costs. Because while Paul Ryan says that these programs have become a hammock, who they've become a hammock for is for business. It's not for the people. Because I know that the Vanessas of the world are working hard to make a difference, to make a change. And that is the story that we need to hear. But I also know that at one of our business roundtables, when I raised the issue Jason raised, one of the entrepreneurs said, yeah, well, why wouldn't, why wouldn't business take an edge if you could get it? Because maybe it's not right. <laughs> what a radical thought. But I was really lucky in that one. The other businessmen hopped on him and gave him a bad time, so I thought, oh, okay, we do have allies. <laughs> so we have our work cut out for us. This will not be easy. But what we have to do is not have a whole bunch of statistics in our head. What you folks are best at is taking the stories. Take the stories of people you know. And Pope Francis says this in his encyclical, and this is what I urge you to do tomorrow. When you're on the hill, Pope Francis says in paragraph 19, if you want to quote him, our goal is not to amass information or to satisfy curiosity, but rather to become painfully aware 
to dare to turn what is happening to the world into our own personal suffering and thus to discover what each of us can do about it. We're counting on you to do your part. Thank you very much. Great. I want to invite folks. Um, we have a few minutes for dialogue, and you can actually line up at the microphones. And uh, I urge folks to make the most of our time. Introduce yourself and let our let Sister Simone know where you're coming from. But then make a make sure you're asking a clear, concise question. And while folks line up, um, we I do want to make a quick reminder that uh, I hope many of you uh, find an opportunity, perhaps over lunch, to confirm your lobby visits or use this as an opportunity to schedule additional lobby visits. It sounds like Wisconsin, we gotta make sure you got that Paul Ryan meeting <laughs> scheduled. Um, uh, so you may use this as an opportunity to make sure that we're making the most of um, lobby day tomorrow. I know we've got well over 250 lobby meetings scheduled, Fabulous. but let's get even Fabulous. more scheduled. And if you do go to Paul Ryan, uh, say that you, you met me because uh, a friend of mine introduced herself to him as being a friend of Sister Simone's, and I'm trying to get a meeting with him, but he, his staff keeps saying, oh, well, he's not ready to meet with Sister again. So, um, <laughs> okay, so we'll alternate between the two. Let's start here at the front. Um, with uh, uh, with um, uh, our debt-based uh, economy and fractional reserve banking, um, some people believe that um, that the economic structure is a machine that systematically moves money from poor people uh, to rich people. Yes. I'm, I'm just, you know, there are some movements to uh, eliminate central banking, you know, to you know shift uh, monetary policy over to uh, independent authorities. Okay, but let your heart be broken. Open. Well, sure. uh, uh, I, I'm just wondering if you could comment. On oh, that. comment on it. There is a bunch of shenanigans afoot, including messing with the central bank, trying to, uh, a bunch of what was happening with Greece was pressure on central banks. One of the challenges for Europe is that they don't have a central bank in order to regulate it. They depend on the monetary policy. Oh, that, that's getting way wonkish. But the, and do you, does everybody know wonk is just no spelled backwards, you know? So you can be in with the in crowd. You're supposed to be so knowledgeable. but. Um, the, the real issue that we need to care about and keep front and center is that this is not about dollars and cents, this is about the people. And it's about we the people making a difference. And I think if we keep that, you, because what happens when you start talking banking policy and the Fed and blah, blah, people's eyes roll back in their heads and it's like, ugh, spare me, spare me. But if we talk about Robin and you talk about Jason and you talk about the folks, it keeps people present and we have to keep them at the heart of the conversation because otherwise dollars will win. People will win if they're at the heart of the conversation. Pope Francis is right. So thank you for that. There's a lot of policy out there that could mess with this up. Yeah. Can we check to make, can, yeah, I don't help, want to turn on. Ken, can you help make sure that microphone's on? Magic. Yeah, yeah well, okay. let's do that while you fix it. Okay. okay. Uh, my name is Dolores Lyons. I'm from Michigan. And for a number of years, I was a television news reporter, and I was also, or I'm not also a retired social worker. Okay. Fabulous. Okay. So my question is, when I was a news reporter, I saw the change during the Reagan years where, could you explain, you know, kind of what happened there? What that, were we thinking? Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Okay, the, the piece that, I, it was the issues around breaking unions, around uh, selling this idea that we knew better how to invest our retirement, so everybody bought into the stock market. It was around, the other piece that I didn't talk about, everybody got credit cards. 
It was the, the spread of credit cards made this possible, and the second person, in, a second adult in the households went to work. And those policies then made people not notice so much the stagnation of wages. And the, the challenge that we, oh, and the fifth thing that he did was that he changed the American story. The American story went from being the group of the community, formed by the community, to being the one person riding a horse by themselves off into the West. And the idealized place was this one person taming the West. And now, I was a kid, I watched these movies. I know a single person didn't usually go West. They went West in a wagon train. How did you circle one wagon, I ask you? <laughs> or, ha or if you had a barn raising and only one person showed up, you can't do it. But what he did was create this individualistic story about ourselves that got bought because it was after a year, era of plenty and we felt we were invincible. And so we bought that myth. What we have to change, the toughest part to culturally change is the cultural story. I mean, policy is one thing, but we've got to change the cultural story that we're founded in community. It is an unpatriotic lie that we're based in individualism. It's we the people, and that's the part that we have to change. Thank you. What? Uh, yeah, yeah. A, a, and, and I hate to say this, I'm a Californian, and we've ex, uh, exported two not so stellar presidents from California. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. But okay, is the mic fixed? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Heather, I'm from Indiana. As you showed with your activity, there's an amazing wealth gap in the U.S. Um, that was actually income. Wealth is even worse. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and we're going to the Hill tomorrow to ask them for tax credits that will help people lift out of poverty a little bit. But is there anything that we can realistically say or ask of our Congress people to try to close that gap? Um, I think you can speak from the heart and say that, yeah, I'm assuming you're EITC and child tax credit? Yeah. Okay. EITC is okay with initials, child tax credit. Say it out because child always <laughs> gets the legislators in their heart, so you want to say child tax credit, not CTC. Even though you look like you're in with the in crowd, use child, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, but, but what you can uh, advocate for is, because they're talking tax reform uh, eventually, is that what we need are, is everybody paying their fair share so that those at the top pay their fair share and that we bring this closer together, that we incentivize wages now, don't get too wonkish about it, but just talk from your heart about why it matters that we've got to pull our nation together because otherwise we're going to lose our democracy. One of the pieces I didn't talk about was Vanessa and was Margaret after Vanessa. The, those two places, those lower 40 percent, is folks are so depressed and working so hard they don't see a reason to vote. And that's driving people out of our, our democracy. Now, a bunch of offices don't care because they get elected by the others, but um, Oh dear, I only have five minutes. We gotta be, I gotta shorten my answers. But yes, just, but talk from the heart. Don't talk from the head, talk Thank from you. the heart. Thank you. Okay, can we get about like three questions and then I'll try to, mm -hmm. or three comments and I'll try, uh, six, really fast. Lisa Marshall, Indiana, thanks for your work. I just wanted to get clear on the statistics. You had said that that was, the, um, those income. incomes were households. Is there an average si uh, household size? It's on our website. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my oh, head. Oh, it's just listed. Okay. I just wanted to get clear on that. I think that. it's four, but I'm not 100% sure. Gotcha. Maybe two adults, two kids. Okay. That helps. Thanks. Two and a half kids. How's that? <laughs> yeah. David Tate from Virginia. And uh, um, churches and religious organizations, uh, the, the members do a tremendous amount of charity and help poverty. But then when they go to the polls, they seem uh, to, you know, on average, vote in politicians that undermine the very thing that they do personally. <laughs> And I'm just wondering why, why, that, why that tends to be that way and what, 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 what has to happen for that to change? It, it's about identity politics and I'm trying to figure out what has to change. Uh, that they identify either with the wannabe rich person, that's why Donald Trump is so scary right now, uh, they want to be rich person, or they identify uh, by either race or someone name familiarity. And so what we have to do is create an alternative relationship 
where we talk one on one with people about who we're going to vote for and why. So it, it's we have to do a ground game. Ooh, I only have three minutes. Hustle, hustle. Okay, through results, I uh, my friend Kathleen Close and I went to Bangladesh, and when we came back, we started a, a, a microcredit uh, nonprofit in Miami. Um, my name is Ellen, by the way. Uh, uh, I just want to tell you the one story, very short. Cecilia bought six, she works uh, uh, for, at a minimum wage job, but with her first loan of $1,000, she went and bought six cribs, you know, used cribs, cleaned them up and everything, and she had a, 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 a child care center for people who worked at the local hospital at night. You know, it was just amazing. So she makes $10,000 more a year, which is typical. That's the average of what our borrowers are making. but. The way you talk, I'm wondering, sometimes you do something and I'm wondering, are we contributing or are we, um, is there some way that, that perhaps we're taking away from, from the general good? I mean, it sounds like it's good, but sometimes, uh, you know, I don't okay. understand the I'm implication a, I'm of what a person, we're doing. Yeah, it's a good question to ask. What are the implications? But the, the really important thing is I'm a person of faith. And so I really believe Pope Francis is that you have to let your heart be broken, which is sound like what happened to you in Bangladesh, and that you figure out what each of us can do about it. And each of us can do something, and you're doing that part, celebrate it, make it happen. And then if there are unintended consequences, adjust. There's always unintended consequences. Reagan sold us really good things, but then there were all these horrible unintended consequences. So we're gonna have to adjust, that's the deal. But do your part, do your part, yes. Hi, I'm Callie, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to thank you for bringing up a really great point. I'm a case manager at a local homeless shelter, and a lot of people look at them and like, oh, you're lazy, you're not working, but transportation is such a big thing that they don't have, and it's really hard for them to get, and I just wanted to thank you for bringing that up, because that's something that really affects them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm Dalton. I'm from Idaho, uh, originally from the Philippines. Um, I've noticed that this conference has focused primarily around the conversation of economic sustainability, but there hasn't been a, a conversation around why these countries are ne in need of economic sustainability. How do we address issues like Western imperialism? Amen. Amen. <laughs> TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership. The TPP, Philippines isn't in it, but Malaysia is. And the Trans-Pacific Partnership is another effort, these free trade agreements, is another effort at imp exporting colon the colonial economy. And uh, that's why we've worked so hard against it. Um, but it uh, now has fast track. Uh, the, the, I'm clearly a DC person. I'm talking wonkish initials. I'm very sorry. But the, the important thing to know is that we need a global analysis of what's happening in our economy. Part of it's US. The U.S. is so large, it really drives the net international reality, but the other piece is that exploitation that's taken care of. And uh, my, my religious community, I have a sister of social service, we have sisters in the Philippines, uh, in Imus, and in the state of Cavite, Das Marinas. but anyway, it's uh, a huge, huge issue of exploitation. And Pope Francis says that we've got an environmental crisis, we've got an e economic crisis, but really we've got one crisis, and it's a crisis of exploitation. That's the piece we have to touch and change. Thank you for raising it. Thank and you. now and, uh, I have to quit because actually, I'm, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let oh. Tiana ask oh. ans ask the last question. Oh, okay. So we, uh, Tiana is one of the witnesses to hunger. <gasps> and, uh, Thank you. I heard I missed your your session. Thank you for being there. Thank you. I actually don't have a question. I just have a comment. And I just wanted to say thank you so much for speaking about the safety net because I think a lot of people don't realize the safety net needs a net. Amen. The safety net has giant holes in it. You get to the top, and it's called the cliff effect. You get to the top, you work your way up, and then you lose your job, and you fall straight off the cliff. Amen. Thinking that the net's going to be there to catch you, you fall straight through to the bottom. And that's the one thing I think Congress doesn't understand. Amen. So that's the one thing we have to let them know tomorrow. Amen. Can, can I just add one thing? In addition, in addition to cliff effect, the other piece is that we require people to spend down to zero so that you have no savings is wrong. So what we know is kids develop much better if their parents even have just maybe three to $5,000 in the bank. There is so much less stress in the family. And that m reduction in stress makes it much better for kids growing up. So the other piece is, in addition to eliminating cliff effects, is to allow for asset accumulation and that people can make a savings because one of the things that happens is once you've spent down, the likelihood of ever getting it back is somewhere around zero. 
So thank you for your witness. Thank you for being a part of this. Thank Join you. me in thanking Sister Simone.